Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. My fear doesn't stand a chance. I'm standing in your love. Amen, amen. Got my cowboy breeches on this morning. Yeah, I ain't wore these in, in years. It's good to get back in a pair of pants. And sometimes you just got to save an old pair of pants to see if you can get back in them every now and then. Right, Sam? <laughs> Amen. So uh, I slipped these on. I thought, okay, come on, preacher. You're doing all right. Took a little ride this, uh, this week, about 1,000 miles up through the hill country. I rode the Twisted Sisters. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know how beautiful that is. And it's very, uh, very exhilarating. I know some people may not consider going around a curve at 65, 70 mile an hour. There's some curves up outside Bandera, Charlie. They're probably a mile long. I'm not talking about little curves. I'm talking about one big, long, sweeping curve. So much so that you just kind of lay that bike over and just accelerate through it. And it is the most divine feeling. When I want to kick back to the left side, I actually drop my hand, Kenny, from the handlebars, reach down, see if I can touch the asphalt. I mean, just, just kind of bump it. You know, just call me crazy. Thank you. So you've known that. That's why you're here. You got a crazy pastor. Amen. And, and I don't just try to be. It's just who I am. Amen. I've been holy wild for so many years. I finally found a definition for it. I just, if you've been forgiven much, you love much. And if you, there's, uh, when you understand the gospel, let me help you real quick. I got history with Jesus. You got history with Jesus. I want you to think with me about this just a minute. One of the reasons why this thing has not put me into a place of panic is because I got history. I've lived through chicken pox. Uh -huh. You search my body, you're going to find little, little scars all over my body where I scratched myself when I was a kid. When mama said, don't touch your face, and you ended up picking the, the sore, and you got, I've been through the mumps, I've been through the flu, I've been through so many things in my life. I've had surgeries, I've dealt with muscular dystrophy. I got history with Jesus. Amen. We've started churches, and we've seen the miraculous happen. We've paid off buildings, and others said, you can't do it, man, there's no way. I've got history with Jesus. Amen. And if you think Gathering back into church is, is uh, um, irresponsible. Let me just help you a little bit for those who think that way at all. If you think it's irresponsible, then you look at a God who sent Moses over into toward uh, leading two million people out toward the Red Sea to a dead end. He sent Moses to a dead end. What kind of God would send you to a dead end? That sounds like an irresponsible God. What kind of God would stand with a 15-year-old boy out facing again against a Goliath and Tell the Goliath, I'm going to take your head from your shoulders and all you got is a strap of leather? Right. He sounds a little irresponsible. What kind of God is it that would put some disciples in a boat and shove them across the water and say, boys, y'all go on across, I see you on the other side, and a storm break out? He sounds a little irresponsible. Or is he just trying to build our faith? Amen. Come on, that's your opportunity to give God a praise right there. Everything God does in your life that pushes you to a point of risk is something to build your faith. Amen. The scripture says to us in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, are you comfortable? In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and you warm my heart seeing you today. Those watching online, I thank you for tuning in today. I believe we've got a word that, that, you know, every week I always pray we've got a word that's going to affect your life. The scripture says to everything there is a season. There's a season. There's a, it has a time limit to it. There is, uh, and because of that, to every purpose under heaven. The scripture says there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down. If you drive Chevys, you know what I'm talking about. It's a time to break down. And there's a time to build up. There's a time to weep. And there's a time to laugh. A time to mourn. And a time to dance. A time to cast away stones. And a time to gather stones together. There's a time to embrace. And there's a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to get. There's a time to lose. There's a time to keep. A time to cast away. A time to rend. And a time to sow. A time to keep silent. And there's a time to speak. 
There's a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. One of the things that I am trying to do my best to discern is the seasons. What season are we in? How long is that season? Not every season has the same length. I believe we're going through a time that we've had over the last two months, a time term from reframing. Amen. I think we're coming back into a time of, of connecting again and embracing. I think we've seen uh, peaks and valleys all over the, the world, and we realize it didn't peak here. I think there's an understanding and a grasping and a gathering. God is a zip code God. He's a zip code God. What's your zip code? 77520. What's your zip code, Kenny? 77532. He's a zip code God. He works here in a different, uh, than he would in St. Louis or California or New York. He's a zip code kind of God. He works in certain geographic areas in different ways. And because of that, I look at him and say, now, I know you're the God of the world, but right now in South Texas, this is what you're doing. This is how you're affecting us. And this is, this, so we want to embrace this season. When I looked at it, we will live. We will die. When you were born, you did not get an immortality tag stuck on the bottom of your foot. Amen. God didn't say you're going to last forever. He said you've got a time here to live, live, and you've got a time to die. You've got a time to plant, harvest, kill, heal, break down, build up, weep, laugh, mourn, dance, cast away stones, gather stones, embrace, refrain from embracing, get loose, keep, cast away, tear, sow, keep silent, speak, love, hate, war, peace, all in, the, in your lifetime, and, or it's in our time. So we have this time that we've got to realize this. I, I want to teach you and talk, preach, teach, preach, whatever is going to happen this morning. I think we've already preached it. On it's inevitable. It's inevitable. The seasons of your life are inevitable. You're going to go through them. You're not going to be able to escape them. Amen. It's unavoidable. Amen. It's certain to happen. There are certain things in your life that are certain to happen. They're going to happen to you. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I ask God that you just anoint my lips, season it with salt, that the hearers may hear and grasp those watching online, that you'd reach through there and make them feel like they're right here in this sanctuary. In Jesus' name. And everyone said. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Hebrews 9, 27 says, Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's what we're doing. We're waiting. We're in a season of waiting. We're waiting on him to come back. But it says here, it's destined for us once to die. I have found out that death is more universal than life. Everyone dies, but not everyone lives. The issue for us is to learn to live. Amen. To enjoy. So he said, Pastor, why would you take a motorcycle ride this week? Because I choose to keep living. Amen. I choose to keep pressing. I, keep, I choose to still gather with my staff and to be with my family. I, there, there's just something about doing that. Every day has to be passed as if it were going to be your last. you got to milk that day and enjoy that day. I read this. I forgot who it was that said it. But he said, I asked God for all things so I could enjoy life. He gave me life so I could enjoy all things. You know, if I know that there are certain things in life that are inevitable, they're unavoidable, then how should I live? If I know that one day that this earth suit that I got, and listen to me, I, I, I know we're online and, and I don't want to embarrass anyone, but last Saturday I did a funeral uh, of a lady who was 66 that died of a heart attack in Lufkin, Texas. Her brother is Barry Johnson. Some of you know Barry Johnson. He's kind of a cowboy figure out at the North Campus. Barry has been with me probably 15 years. Barry just turned 70 years old, and he's kind of semi-retired. He don't really want to retire. He shoots skeet with us, uh, Steve. You've seen Barry out there. He, this was his sister. Barry wears a long coat like his pastor. And he, he looks kind of suave and debonair, you know? And that was last Saturday. Well, his wife, Susan, called me Thursday. She said, Pastor, pray for Barry. I said, what's, what's happened with Barry? She said, he's in a wheelchair. I said, okay. Oh, what happened? He got a brain tumor. It's pressed in his brain, blinded his left eye, took away his left hearing, and took out his ability to walk. He's right now in intensive care with an extremely fast-moving tumor. He needs our prayers. Amen. Because they, they, they're only giving him a little bit now to even live. And Barry's already decided, okay, whatever, God, you want to do, there is a time to live and there is a time to die. Uh, you know, it, we're so focused on one thing all the time right now that we forget that life still goes on and we still got to encourage. So can we take just a minute and pray for Barry? Father, in the name of Jesus, would you transcend time and space? Would you send your healing power into the Methodist Hospital downtown right now and touch our friend Barry Johnson? I want him to know that this church loves him. He's cared for. 
God, not only that, you're going to have to wrap your hand around his brain and squeeze that cancer out. God, that tumor out in the name of Jesus. Give this man life. Give him purpose. Give him the ability to hang on in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen, amen. Matter of fact, they were going to do their best to be at church today. But uh, unforeseen things happened. He ended up down at the hospital. If you knew, if you really knew, if you had it into your thinking that this is all I got here, what would, it, what would you do different? One of the things I've always realized is that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he tells us before this scripture, before verse 25, he says, cast your treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't touch it. Put your treasures up north. Amen. Get, get cast them ahead. In other words, what we do here matters there. So it's important for us to get. And then he goes on to tell the disciples not to worry. The word worry means to consume in thought, to establish as our first interest, mental preoccupation, priority concern, fretting, fear of the unknown, and to rehearse the future in which we have no control. Hold that right there. This is something your pastor has been preaching for you for 20 years. If you've been around me any time at all, you've heard me say this before. But all of a sudden, now this makes better sense to us. Look at it again. To consume in thought, to establish as our first interest, mental preoccupation, how much of what has happened over the last two and a half months controlled your mind and has been a mental... I mean, even down to our children. Our kids ain't going to school. They're having to stay home. Why are we staying home? And they're hearing about this virus over and over and over again. And it's, it's held hold of us. It, has a, it becomes a priority. Amen. The fear of the unknown. And to rehearse the future in which we have no control. This is worry. To rehearse. I don't have no control over the future. I get today. And if I want to make today good, that's up to me. Amen. My day is going to be as good as I want it to be. But I can't worry. So Jesus said, stop worrying. As a matter of fact, can I tell you? It's the 11th commandment. Amen. Do not worry. Quit worrying. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? I thought food was life. No, 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 it's not. You, you, you eat to live, not live to eat. You better get that right or you're going to find yourself in trouble. Amen. Uh, where was the preacher? Okay. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds the birds. Are you not much more valuable than they? Everybody say, I'm more valuable than a bird. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not one, not, not, not even Solomon, as wise as he was, in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? That's what the pagans are running after. I mean, in other words, what he's saying, that's what the unbelievers are running after. Those are the ones that don't know God. If you want to please God, you trust God. You trust Him. You believe in Him. You say, I know you can do it, God. And your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, my friend, God feeds the birds... He clothes the grass. He got you. God's got you. Amen. He's got you in this inevitable, unavoidable time of your life. Amen. God has you. See, the problem with worry is it breeds a spirit. The spirit is called fear. And listen, fear is a terrible lens to look through life at. And when you look through life through the, the lens of fear, it distorts things. It, it magnifies that which is little in your life. You know, we could be at the greatest threshold that God has for us, but fear begins to hold us back. We have reached more people online than I ever dreamed we would. Amen. And it's still reaching, still reaching. People are still sharing and getting it out. I'm so excited to see what, I'm glad we didn't back off that we pressed in. Can I get an amen? The scripture tells us, Romans chapter 8 verse 15, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again. Because it fear will enslave you to fear. But you receive the spirit of sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The message, and you know I love this, it's printed on the back of this pulpit. You need to come and look at it sometime. Actually says, God's spirit beckons. There are things to do, places to go. This resurrected life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. God didn't resurrect your life so you can tend your grave. 
Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> he didn't resurrect you so you can tend your grave. He didn't resurrect you so you could hang out waiting to die. He resurrected you so that you could live. It's an adventurously expectant greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? Say it with me. What's next, Papa? Amen. It's in my heart's cry. What do you want to do next, God? So the opposite of fear, according to 1 John 4, 8, is not courage. It's not me trying to build my courage up or, 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 or get a little bit more excited or, or to sing myself. The opposite of fear is love. Tell them I love you. You know, I, I, I understand what people are feeling. I really do. I've, I've dealt with people right now that, that, that are talking about their immune system is compromised. Can I be honest with you? The older you get, the more compromised you are. Eventually, we're all compromised. Amen. It's just the way it is. It's life. So I, I, I'll give them a fist bump, and if they go for the handshake or the hug, I'll go for that too. But I give them the option. You know, because I'm the preacher. I give you the option. I go with a fist bump. But, but if you want to go for the hug, Parker, I give you a hug. You know, I'm, I'm all right with all that too. Listen, 1 John 4, because I love you. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. It's almost like God saw this coming 2,000 years ago and said, guys, this has been life. This is how life works. Fear always springs from ignorance. Fear always springs from ignorance. You've got to stay learning and questioning and asking, why am I fearful? Why am I so bothered about what I'm seeing and hearing here? The, uh, listen, the average sneeze. Let me, let me put some things to The average sneeze carries, how many feet, Pastor? 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 26, 27 feet, the average sneeze. Look it up. In other words, I'm using the CDC to see how, how it works. So they tell you to be six foot apart from one another. And yet the sneeze carries 27 feet. Dennis told me that he saw a video with the CDC that when you sneeze in the grocery store, it, it, store, it carries over the aisle to the next side. Am I scaring you yet? <laughs> so six feet apart is not going to help you. Well, then we'll stay home and be safe. We'll look it up. In New York City, 100 hospitals, 100 hospitals just came out with the latest report that 66% of those that caught the virus caught it staying home. Right. Come on. 66% out of 100 hospitals said staying home got me sick. Stay home, be safe. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you hearing me? So what we're doing is, again, fear always springs from ignorance. If, if, you, if you have this ignorance, and, and I'm not calling people ignorant. I'm just saying we're listening sometimes. We, I just use the same stuff they've been teaching. In other words, the science ain't caught up with this thing is. There's a panic into it. That's what pandemonium means. There's a shout from a mythological god that scared everyone. So 27 feet. I can't stay away from people 27 feet. Can't do it at Walmart, can't do it at church, can't do it at hardware store, you can't do it at home, you can't do it. And so if I stay home, I can still get it. Well, how, how are they getting it? Did you know <laughs> this week they just came out with this one? That COVID, you can carry it on your feet. So if I walk into your virus, I'm walking your virus somewhere else. I read that and I thought to myself, oh God, help all them Tide Pod eaters. Please, God, tell them not to lick the bottom of their shoe. <laughs> so what are you saying, Pastor? This is what I'm saying. I live in East Texas, and I deal with copperheads. They everywhere. Tommy, you've got to camp out in Freer, Texas. The rattlesnakes are longer than you are tall. They, they ever, this, they, they, they. And no matter how hard we try to eradicate them and get rid of them, we can't do it. Because those snakes just keep showing up. Amen. Black widows underneath stuff. They there. Coral snakes. We found them in the swimming pool. So what we figured out is we're going to do our best to watch out for it. But we're living with them. This virus, we're going to live with it. There are 10 to the 31 zeros. It's called a nantillion. 
You don't even understand how big that is. It's way past trillion. 10 to 31 zeros, viruses on this planet. That's how many viruses are here. You want to hear that's from National Geographic. And National Geo also said this. This is kind of funny. They said there's 1.7 million we hadn't discovered. <laughs> Hold on. If you ain't discovered it yet, James, how do you know it's 1.7 million? So I'm listening to that and I'm going, man, we, we have just, God, shatter our ignorance. Help us to get biblical truth. Hang on to it. People need to be touched. There needs to be community. I can't stand them. I, you know, I, the last funeral I did, they had a chair here, a chair here, a chair here. Our folk walked in, grabbed all the chairs, shoved them together, and sat together. <laughs> you know, because and then the police kept showing up at this funeral home to make sure people were sitting properly. And I'm thinking, God, don't put our police in this, in this crazy place. Oh, they don't want to be there. They want to be dealing with criminals, not, not people that are, are trying to do the right thing. But to die in a hospital without your loved ones there. To go to a funeral of a, of a 97-year-old man who's had a, 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 a war record and not have enough more than 10 people there. That's not right. That's not right. In, in the name of God, our ignorance needs to be shattered. Can I get an amen? But, you know, listen, here, here's another. I'll throw this at you. 80,000. We're at 80,000 now of those who have died either with or of. And there's a difference. With or of COVID. So this, this guy showed up, the U.S. General, Jerome Adams. You may have seen him on TV. He's a young doctor. He warned that 480,000 Americans are going to die this year. 480,000 are going to die this year from cigarettes. Are you hearing the preacher? I'm not against you smoking. You can go out any way you want. Eighty-some thousand going to die alcohol-related. I'm not going to beat you up. You're smart enough to read your own Bible. Know how to take care of yourself. I'm just telling you that we have focused on one thing and one thing only. It has caused us to come into a panic. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I ain't seen it yet. Amen. But I'm believing God for the best. Can I get an amen? Amen. Faith and fear, they're both unseen. Faith and fear are both unseen. One hopes for the best and the other one's looking for the worst. Faith is hoping for the best. I'm believing for the best. Fear saying, I'm looking for the worst. This has got to be the worst thing I've ever seen. Somebody's going to track it on their tennis shoes into my house. 27 feet, Pastor. 27 feet. I can't get more 27 feet. That's fear. Well, faith says, God got me. Faith said, God got me. God said, he can lead me to the Red Sea and part it. He can send a giant in front of me and bring him down. Amen. He put me in, the, in a boat and be there with me walking on the water. Can I get an amen? He's trying to build my faith. Faith imprisons you. Faith, excuse me, fear imprisons you. Faith liberates. Fear paralyzes. Faith empowers. Fear disheartens. Faith encourages. Fear sickens. Faith heals. Fear makes useless. Faith makes serviceable. And most of all, fear puts hopelessness at the heart of life while faith rejoices in its God. Did you know there are people that have already turned me off online now because they don't want to hear a message about faith? They want to hear it because they want to stay in their fear. Yeah. Amen. There, there's something about it. By the way, it gives drama a little bit more action. I'm done with the drama. I have two angels. I've always said they have followed me. I've got two angels that love me. They've been with my family through thick and thin car wrecks. Last Saturday, we went up to pick my daughter Jill up in Corsicana. She had a, a, her, her a vehicle a malfunction. It was a Ford. And uh, she wrecked. So I'm just, that's for you Chevy owners. I got to make y'all feel good. I had to go up and pick her up. It's a wonder. She didn't want I'm telling you, angels were with her. I have angels that I've dispatched. I believe in angels. Psalm 23, verse 6, David talked about them. He said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Amen. As I move through life, goodness and mercy will be with me. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One day I will be in the house. Everybody say the house. You know, I love this house, but there's going to be another house for us later. They shall follow me. It's the certainty of their companionship. Surely, they always with me. I remind myself of goodness and mercy. It's the persistence of these two angels. All the days of my life. Amen. As I move through life, I got this mercy. I got goodness with me. And they are faithful. They are firm. They stay with me. They support me. Amen. They take me by the hands and they remind me. Goodness, my friend, will crawl up on your lap and lick your wounds and whisper in your ear. Psalm 27 13, I am expecting the Lord to rescue me again so that once again I will see his goodness to me here in the land of the living. What am I looking for? A good, good God in the land of the living. Amen. He's a good God. Amen. That's what goodness does. That other angel, mercy, is going to crawl up and cuddle beside you and whisper in your ear ever so softly, I have your back. 
I have your back. When there's a defender against you, I'm going to say, I got your back. When, some, when, 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 the, the, uh, when the devil comes and says that you don't deserve it, I got your back. Amen. Mercy is a wonderful thing. Can I get an amen? I will follow you. I haven't come this far to leave you now. Remember, God shows mercy to his anointed. Amen. And that's all of you. All of you anointed. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. I, I don't, I'm not concerned about a vaccine. I'm concerned with living whatever is going on on this planet. That's it. I'm going to live with it. I'm going to live with them copperheads. And we'll cut the head off every time I get a chance. Amen. Do whatever I have to do, but I'm going to have to live with it. Amen. Because they, they're not going to, they, they made all of a sudden this is the end all of end alls. It's not. Amen. There was a Hong Kong flu in 68 through 70. Back before the black plagues, there's always been issues on this planet of viruses and sicknesses. And there's times that you have to live with. Well, Pastor, what if it takes me out? Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. And I, I'm not trying. I'm a grandpa. I want to hang out with my grandkids. I want to enjoy as much life as I can here. But I was not born with an immortality sticker on my foot. Amen. One day I got to leave this planet like so many that I have done funerals for in this house. Amen. And I, I just say, God, whenever you're ready, I'm not going to live in the fear of death. Amen. I'm going to live in... Listen, life is so unpredictable. Like I mentioned about Barry's life. You, you, don't, you don't know. We don't even know what will happen today, much less next week or next year. The truth is no one can predict the future. Life is brief. Our lives are like a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. The Greek word there is the word atmos. It's, it's brief. It's atmos. We get the word atmosphere. It's like a misty cloud. Our lives are like a, a fog in the grand scheme of things. Friends, life is too unpredictable, too brief to live it, not knowing our final destiny. You've got to know Jesus. You've got to know Jesus. Amen. You got you got to understand. He got you, man. It's it's unavoidable what we're going through, the seasons and the times we got. But you got to know Jesus. Psalm thirty nine, verse four. I found this verse. You've heard me say for for years. God, just give me a heads up before I die. Just give me a heads up. Just let me know. You know, just 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 give me a. I don't care if it's a couple of seconds or like the thief on the cross. Just give me a heads up, and then I found it. Show me, O oh Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. God, show me. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. No matter how secure you think you are, it's just <gasps> a breath to God. Amen. And then life is over. So give me a heads up, God. Amen. One of the things that I have uh, that I've worked on doing is to make sure that I have some semblance of a wheel. Because I've, I've accumulated a few things in my life. And, and so having a wheel is an important thing. Would you agree with me? Yeah. Amen. Whatever your age, you know. Because you don't want people fighting over your stuff when you're gone. Amen. You want those to get the things that you want them to have. Whether it be people that you know, a family, a uh, uh, church, uh, whatever it is. You want to make sure they get there. So I decided, what is the will of our family? What is your will? What is the will that we can say together? Amen. First, we will not worry. Everybody say, we will not worry. You see it on here. We're going to say this together. This is a will that we're writing down. We're saying verbally. Worry is the most unproductive of all human activities. Don't let what you cannot change change you. Number two, say it with me. We will not be fearful. And I know this is a fight. You're going to have to, because every now and then you're going to panic. Every now and then you get a little scared. But you've got to shake this thing. For most of the things we fear will never come to pass. Amen. Number three, say it with me. We will not cross bridges before we come to them. Listen to me. Uh, there are things I don't know yet. I don't know how it's going to go. So I can't cross that bridge just yet. For no one has yet succeeded at accomplishing that. Number four. We will face each problem as it comes. It's the domino principle. One domino at a time. Amen. If I get too many, it's going to overwhelm me. So I got to take it one at a time. I got to deal with it. You don't fix supper in the morning. Good breakfast. One domino at a time. Some man that hasn't got breakfast in a long time said amen right then. Amen. It's one domino at a time. We can only handle one at a time anyway. Number five, say it with me. We will not take problems to bed with us. You want to sleep well? Quit taking problems to bed. Amen. For, for they're going to make very poor bedmates. Amen. You don't want that to happen in your life. Number six, we will not borrow other people's problems. 
I'm sorry. I should have left that now. Because that would ruin most of your Facebook time. Say it with me again. We will not borrow other people's problems. Look, you can handle yours. I can handle mine. We can join up and pray together about each other's. But there are people that got problems. They are always going to have problems. My goodness, they have problems. I told you years ago, on my phone, I got A and C written by certain people's names. Amen. C is a connection. There's somebody that, that has been down. I helped them up. And when I was down, they helped me up. There's a reciprocating force in our lives. We've been friends. We've been brothers and sisters. We've worked with one another. That is a connection. And then there are attachments. They're like vacuum cleaners. You think it's Eureka. But it's really a dirt devil. They will suck the life out of you. Every time they call, every time you get an email, every time you get a text, every time you hear from them, it's never, what can I do for you? It's, help me. I got a problem. Now, I know I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to help people with problems. But I found scripture says we're all ministers. Where are there no big eyes and little U's? Amen. We all in this together. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, I'll leave. And don't ask me if you got an A or if I got an A or C. Go and look at my phone. Let me just say this. If I answer your call, you're good. <laughs> But every now and then, I call people, they don't answer mine, and I go, oh, no. I must have got an A beside that, beside that name. Number seven, we will not try to relive yesterday for good or bad. It's gone forever. It's gone. Amen. We'll concentrate on what is happening in our life right now and make the best of it. We will be good listeners. Oh, it's hard. I just want to interrupt people all the time whenever I start sensing ignorance or something. And, and i got to be careful. God, help me. I am the worst at this, so I say it. God, help me put this in my will that I become a better listener. Amen. Even if what they're saying don't make sense. <laughs> For only when we listen, Josiah, only when we listen do we hear ideas different from our own. I've been on Zoom meetings with pastors and said barely a word. I've listened. I've listened to what the God of their zip code is saying to them. I talked to my pastor this morning. He still has to go online. Be it that the weather's too bad to even do drive-ins. They keep getting rain. But, but I'm listening. And when I said this morning, I said, you know, pastor, he's the God of the zip code. Well, I heard the light bell go off in his head, the light bulb. He said, you are so right. Amen. We can't compare church to church. We can't compare area to area. I would say open up a lot of this country, amen, because a lot of this country is, has no problems right now. Amen. And even if they do, they're going to be able to deal with it very quickly. Let's get back to work. Let's get this place. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Uh, where am I at? Number nine here. We will not become bogged down by frustration. Oh. 90% of frustration is rooted in self-pity. It will only interfere with positive. Listen, we as a church in the last three years have been through two floods and a pandemic. Two floods. Took my home out. Took, took their homes out. It took our churches out. And you talking about being frustrated, having to deal with the federal government, having to deal with, with uh, things that have gone on, having to rebuild again, start over again, get the churches back up again, stay the course. Amen. Frustration will bog you down. You got to get a plan and you got to work on it, and it's little by little until you're able to overcome. Amen. You got to stay with it. Can I get an amen? Amen. So don't let it bog you down. You're an amazing church. You're an amazing group of people. Those watching, you're amazing. What I'm sensing, what I'm seeing, we've, we've come through things. We're going to come through this. I know there are things that are inevitable, they're unavoidable, there's seasons in life that are going to take place, but we're going to come through this, and we're going to be better on the other side. Come on, somebody give me a shout in this house. Amen. Last point, our last point of our will. We will count all our blessings and never overlook the small ones. Man, when I saw some of your faces this morning, I said, Lord, look at the blessings in this house. Woo, I've missed some. I've got, I've got letters from you and encouragement from you, emails and messages and texts. But to see your face, to hear your voice, 
to hear your praise while ago was a blessing in my life. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Father, I thank you for this house. There are inevitable things that are taking place. Would you bow your head just for a moment? Let me just talk to you very quickly. The worst thing you can do right now is go through the hardships that you are hearing around the world and not have a God that can rescue you. To not have Jesus walk with you. To not be able to dispatch mercy and goodness to hang out with you and your family. To allow fear to grip you. You've got to remind yourself you're a child of the King. Fear don't live in your life. Amen. You might get a little scared at times, but you're going to shake this thing. But if you've been without God, if you've been backslid, or you don't know Him as Savior, would you slip your hand up right now let me pray for you? Just throw your hand in the air. Let me pray, because I don't know everybody in this room. And if you're watching online, talking to you too. And I want to pray this with you. Thank you. Amen. Pray this with you. Lord Jesus, everybody praying together. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Fill me with faith. Give me the ability to stand with whatever comes. Put goodness and mercy. Dispatch them. Put them on my side. Let them work with me. Let them work with my family. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I will forever love you, serve you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give God a praise in this house. All right. So what did the preacher tell you? There are certain things that are unavoidable. They're inevitable. We're going to have to live with it. We've got to live with a lot of stuff. Amen. You live with it. So press in. I'm not telling you to be, uh, you know, some people think I'm trying to be reckless. I serve a wild God. I do. He's told me to do some crazy things. I, starting churches, first off, is crazy. Taking one, ah, that's no problem. Take somebody else's problems, that's what you're taking. But man, to, to, to be able to step into a situation, an empty place, and ask God to fill it. You know, I, I was talking to God last night, and He brought up several of your names. It's okay, He, he loves you. He wasn't mad at you. But He brought you up, Connie. Amen. He loves you, man. He's behind you. There are those that, they, they can't be here today. I understand that. Oh, I understand that. But as we start, and some people don't even know we're open yet. Some folks don't even know we're open yet. So get the word out. We'll be having church next week. As of right now, we plan on having the nursery and the children's church open. I got children's teachers that's so, you know, they're disappointed. Look at the loss we had. Graduates lost the opportunity to walk. Parker, you lost the opportunity. Yeah, he's going to get to. He's going to do something. But I'm just telling you that a lot of them have lost it around, around the U.S. Uh, the loss of getting to be at a funeral with a loved one. The loss of getting to be at a wedding with people that you cared for. But the loss of having community. We've lost, we lost that over the last two months. Those are losses in our life. We, we, some of this we don't get back. Well, sometimes I think we have to take some things back. And say, you know, it's just, God of this zip code said it's cool to move back into it. So there are losses. People lost some things. But we gained family time. We gained health. We gained weight. We, we've gained a few things over the last two months. But as, our, our, as this church family grows, and I found out something else. Uh, Lawrence, I know, you, I know you're slipping out. You've got to go. Do you all remember the man that always was, was with Lawrence? Bill. Bill's moved. Where'd he go to? Arkansas. They always go to Arkansas. Always Richard goes to Arkansas. Don goes to Arkansas. Arkansas. And somebody... Raising chickens. By raising chickens. 
There are offering envelopes there inside the pews in front of you. If you need an offering envelope, please take one. Amen. And they'll be taking the offering up at the back door. There'll be a few different things. But our teachers have lost time with the kids. They lost the opportunity to go to the ark. They're supposed to go to the ark in June in, in Kentucky. It's still going to happen. It's still going to happen. It's postponed. We lost the opportunity to have Muscle Car Sunday. It's still going to happen. Probably around September is what I'm guessing. A lot of things have been postponed. Get ready. When things really open back up, we're going to be slamming. Boom, boom, boom. Because we're not quitting all this stuff. We're just pushing it up. It's going to be a crazy fall when we get to it. Amen. Some of you have been wanting a CHL. What was that certified handgun class? License? Steve, Steve Burgess, lift your hand. Jamie, amen. They, they have a place up in Hardin, Pecan Meadows, a shooting range. In two weeks, they're going to have the CHL class, $70. If you want to get your CHL. I probably got to go because I, I got to renew mine. Every time you buy a gun, if you got a CHL, man, they, you can get your gun. If you ain't, then it's going to get delayed. Right, David? Right. <laughs> so everybody's got your offering envelope. Those watching online, you have learned. How, and a lot of you have learned how to give online. How many of you have learned how to give online? Lift your hand. I'm telling you, a, a lot of our giving is coming online now. So we thank you for being faithful in your giving. Your, your faithfulness is able to take, keep things rolling, keep things going. Amen. So we thank God for that. You're an amazing church. Everybody got your offering ready? You got it ready? Okay. Will you stand with me? If you were at home watching me online, did you say this? Do you remember saying this? How many know some of you are going to need jobs and better jobs? Huh? You're going to need jobs and better jobs. It's going to be good to, good to have you all here. I prayed for you all last week. You're welcome, darling. Say it with me. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Remember, you're giving at the back door. Hallelujah. I love you guys. Hey, hold on. There's a sign out front. There's a sign right out here that says, no fear here, just family. Would you stop by that, give your phone to somebody and say, take a picture of us by that sign and post it to let folk know, because this is the issue with the church life. Family got to set together. Welcome to the family. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.